Welcome back to The Move, where we are vibing with the book at least 10 minutes at a time. Next 10 minutes, we're looking at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 10. And today is a special day. Oh, why is that? Because today we have a guest amongst us. Ooh. Actually, a former host of The Move. That's right. right. From season uh, yeah. three. three. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yes. The three. one. The only. The incomparable. <laughs> That's not the right word. That's not the right sound. I said caca caca. Yeah, That's not an yeah, eagle. The bald eagle. Hey, oh. welcome back, Tyler. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a real treat. <laughs> <laughs> Still got you here. Uh, got to talk to Elder Morrison this morning, your yeah. father, who's coming on island because uh, y'all are going to be co-teaching with your wife and mm-hmm. your parents and some other friends of ours. Yeah, that's going to be a seminar. Yeah, literally a first. It's, a year ago, I was like, hey, would you guys ever want to do like maybe some marriage stuff together? Because Morgan and I have been doing this thing with Love Reality for a couple, three years now. Yeah. And I know my parents used to do that kind of stuff way back in the day. Yeah. And I was like, hey, we should do this. So now, thanks to Kailua Church and and the the go get them attitude of Jonathan Leonardo, it's actually going to happen. We're going to do nope. something together. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. I'm just realizing in this moment that we're actually doing what Tyler set out to do and put in my ear Oh, like a year and a half ago, two years ago. You're like, yo, do you think that ever as a ministry we could start doing marriage things? And I was like, yeah, man, cool story. Because there's so many things that we're all constantly thinking about sure, doing, right? Sure. And it's only now as you're saying this that I'm like, Huh. How, how many of the, the good ideas do you think have its an origin from... In Tyler? A lot of them. <laughs> yeah, so that was the question I was going to share. <laughs> no, like what happens is that I think ideas get tossed around, but it's the way that the Lord leads and things happen that, yeah, man, they just come together. Because this whole idea of even the go get them attitude, right? I know, mm-hmm. like playfully, but mm-hmm. even to some degree about my hustle has always been within ministry. Mm-hmm. Like I'm terrible outside of ministry. I would try to hustle outside of ministry, like business, this and that. I'm like, me. <laughs> but in ministry, I'm like, yo, let's do this. Let's try this idea. Uh-huh, let's, uh-huh. you know, pop maybe. And so when he says that, I'm like, yeah, that rings true. Mm. And yet I've also described my walk in faith as an old man stumbling forward all the time, but that I, never falls. I, I feel that intimately nearly every time we try and sit down to record and you have some responsibility with technology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So old man stumbling <laughs> forward. Right? Yeah. Because it used to be a toddler stumbling forward, but yeah. you switched to old man. Yeah, I'm and an old man. It's contextually appropriate. So yeah. now that you're saying like, oh, we set out to do this thing. I'm like that old man who's stumbling and is taking a look at that thing that's happening next to my, oh yeah, we did. Like, <laughs> It's not of my own doing in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, yeah. If anything, it was an idea you had and like, oh, it's happening. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be fun. Awesome. Uh, is that, and, and maybe this is the wrong time to ask a question because the answer might be no, but is that going to be recorded and shared in any way, live stream maybe? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So Hebrews chapter, <laughs> chapter nine. nine. <laughs> yeah, great the question. earthly holy place. Tyler, you had a, a comment as we were kind of turning on the mics that something seems to hinge on one thing, or at least the whole thing seems to hinge on one thing. You want to start us off with that? Sure. I mean, just at first glance when I'm reading through it, uh, and it's actually something that I highlighted the last time I studied through Hebrews, it looks like a lot of context, verses one through seven, where it's describing how the uh, earthly holy place, the title at the top, kind of operated, but then verse 8 says, by this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, Hmm. which is symbolic for the present age. It kind of feels like that parenthesis is saying like, by the way, this is for us now. What I'm saying here is for us now. Which which would make a lot of sense because in the previous chapter, it was using language of like obsolete and faulty, like there's this old way of doing things, not so good. He's Mm -hmm. expanding on this idea and now he's using the language of not just the covenants, but Mm -hmm. the sanctuary service itself yeah so that the sanctuary service the way that it's presented up to now through its construction in the wilderness it's then being built up by solomon uh first destruction second building zerubbabel and as it stands right now it is a iteration of a reality that is somehow going to be overcome by a greater and more permanent Hmm. reality and so that in verse eight it's like this, this deals with the present age, and yet there is the mm. age to come that is represented by something that is more sturdy than that which we have had up mm. till now. So, so the idea of the sanctuary kind of evolving in its presentation shouldn't be entirely surprising. There was that tent in the wilderness. Yes. There's the different versions of the temple yes. as it's evolving. And maybe evolving is not great language because, well, actually, maybe it is great language because the thing dies, it's mm-hmm. destroyed, and another one is mm-hmm. replacing it. So I guess... 
strictly speaking. That's kind of what is happening. Yeah, I would say that it has different iterations and it has different iterations, but the theme and the teaching remains the same, which mm. is this is the place where heaven and earth meet, yeah. right? Particularly in the most holy place where you have the symbolism of the seraphim, the cherubim running through. You would see, you would have seen that in the embroidering of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And you would have seen this again in the embroidering, but now it's in a more permanent way in the tabernacle of both Solomon, the temple of Solomon, and the one, the second one of Zerubbabel, that the imagery of the most holy place is heaven and earth meeting, right? When you say the embroidery of the first one, you're alluding to that there was like an actual picture on the wall, the curtains? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it was that of... Seraphim and cherubim, right? Fancy names for angels? Or uh, I guess we would think of them as angels. Yeah, we would think about them as angels, but, but it's different things. It's, yeah, it's the other way around, right? Sure. What the Bible calls seraphim and cherubim, we think of as angels, but they're actually seraphim and cherubim. God. Right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a, maybe a type of messenger. Spiritual being? Yeah, if, of the unseen realm, right? Mm, okay. Yeah. So in the first iteration, it's on the curtains, and the second and third iteration. It's on the walls, and it's in the curtains, and then more specifically, the ones that we remember the most, right, is... Uh, the on, ones on the ark? Yeah. Yeah. Which we cannot speak in detail at this time. <laughs> What's the deal with that? Yeah. <laughs> that's a great question. I think, yeah, that's a great question. There are some ideas about it, but I don't, I don't mean... Is that where we insert what, the, the, the cricket sound? I feel like yeah. I'm missing something here. I, I'm not familiar it with that It says it right here. Oh, oh, yeah. it's a reference to what it says. Oh, yeah. Don't talk about it. <laughs> got it, yeah. got it. The first rule of the Ark of the Covenant is... Don't talk about it. Don't, don't, don't talk about it. it. There's no time to talk about the Ark of the Covenant. But there's uh, something going on here. Um, there is the setting of a stage for more revelation that's going to come in the coming chapters, particularly in verse chapter 9 and turn 10. But we cannot forget that as uh, the pastor of Hebrews is setting out the groundwork for the sanctuary in Hebrews 9, that still in orbit is this imagery of Melchizedek. Right. Right. And uh, we didn't go, I mean, we've talked about Melchizedek, but it is important to note that Melchizedek is this figure that is an enigma of sorts that is very much on the mind of the first century Hebrew only because the legend of Melchizedek is exists in a various form. So one form would have been he's the Canaanite king who's the first priest of God who appears in, you know, to Abraham, right? A second iteration of the legend of Melchizedek is that Melchizedek is the host of some sort of celestial army. This is actually found in um, some writings of the intertestamental period. Another legend of Melchizedek is that Melchizedek is actually the son of the wife of Noah's brother, who, uh -huh. when he finds out that his wife is pregnant, believing that she could not have children, I think he, he dies? Does he die? Yeah, I think he dies. Oh no, the, the the woman dies. Either way, it's Noah's like nephew. brother. Yeah, it's Noah's nephew. And when he comes out of the womb, he comes out fully formed as a child who's like just sitting there. And this is the enigma of Melchizedek. <laughs> These are some of the ideas. Right? Can I pick a favorite without saying that like that's the one I believe? Sure. My favorite is definitely like the celestial host of army. Like that's kind of dope to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so just remember that. Melchizedek is still in orbit mm -hmm. and think about the sanctuary service, but the sanctuary as it's being described in Hebrews nine is not the sanctuary that Melchizedek, who's still sort of in mm. orbit, actually corresponds to. So uh, it, to the kind of intuitive or the thoughtful listener to the book of Hebrews, the reader of the book of Hebrews is like, oh, so there's going to be kind of this next level of the sanctuary we're probably going to connect the dots. He's been talking about what kills it. He's been talking about Jesus. He's been talking about this other iteration of the yeah. sanctuary. It's probably all going to come together. Yeah, yeah. And it goes back to the point of what uh, Tyler highlighted, verse 8, right? You go to verse 8, and it's like, By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing. What's that referring to? It's referring to... That when the sanctuary gets inaugurated, you think about Exodus chapter 24, Numbers chapter 7, you have the nation of Israel, you have Moses reads the book of the law, the people are like, yeah, we'll do it all. Then he sprinkles them with blood. Uh, in number 7, you see all this sort of initiating procedural sacrifices that happen. 
and basically the sanctuary is now open for business. Mm -hmm. It's like, ah, it's open for business. Here we go, right? Like a ribbon cutting type deal, inauguration in that way. Yeah, yeah. And so once the sanctuary is open for business, what do the Levitical priests, the Levitical priests who have access to the sanctuary, what do they need to bring in to the first apartment, which is the Mm -hmm. holy place, Mm -hmm. what do they need to bring in in order to justify their access? Trick question. Blood? Well, justify their access? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah, okay. Right? I, I was nervous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, uh, Sounds like this the is answer recorded. is Jesus, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> what do they need to bring in? Jesus? <laughs> no, they don't bring in anything, right? Okay. To they, justify their access. Yeah. Because they are priests. Yeah, because they're Levitical priests. They can come in. They do happen to show up with blood. No, not in the first apartment. Oh. Because what if they're just going to, you know, change the bread out? Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. What justifies their... So there's the ritual where they do bring in blood and there's this whole thing that happens, but there's there's a whole bunch of other instances Mm -hmm. where they just hang out because they're priests and priests minister in this part of the sanctuary. So So on the inaugural day, they just go in. Well, the inaugural day, they're sprinkled with blood, Mm -hmm. right? The people, and then specifically number seven, the priests, like they now have access because the temple, the sanctuary has been inaugurated. It has Mm. been open for business. Mm. Because it's there. Because it's there. So the fact that it exists is what gives them access. Yeah, and the fact that they are the personnel that has Mm. access. You've ever been to a place that's employee only? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, like just this morning, I picked Tyler up at, uh, where would I pick you up at? A Toyota dealer. He was at the Toyota (laughs) dealer. And when I picked him up, like when I went to go out, it said, you know, employees only, this is not an exit, right? So, I don't know, do you work for Toyota? No. Neither do I. So that means we don't have access. We <laughs> cannot go. But if some guy dressed in a Toyota uniform that says, you know, employee, and then it has his name or her name, like they have access. Mm-hmm. In that same way, the Levitical priests, right, mm-hmm. that were appointed with access could go into the first apartment without any need for blood. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Was, yep. was this also true of the most holy place? Ah, and now we get into a very interesting sort of observation. <laughs> what if, because could the could you have access to the most holy place in the same way? My understanding was no. No, you didn't. That there was even a, a penalty incurred if you showed up on the wrong time, the wrong place, without the, the credentials, so to yeah. speak. So look at verse six, nine okay. six. These preparations having been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. Hmm. But into the second, only the high priest. So not every priest, no, just one of the special. One. Okay. See how exclusive the one percent. And he, but once a year, once a year. So how often can this one person go mm-hmm. into the most holy place? Annually, once. And just once, right? Mm-hmm. And watch this. And not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. Mm-hmm. So in the sanctuary being open for business there is still an indicator within the sanctuary itself that there is an, an access point that isn't open for regular business. Hmm. You can't just go in and out. Hmm. The only person that can go there is this one person. And the only way that they can go is if they offer blood for themselves. So that same ritual that was done at the beginning with the inauguration and the blood, this person in some way has to do that. Every time. And mm. only once a year. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So if you're watching this ritual and you see priests move in and out of the first apartment regularly, but then you see the second apartment, that is the nexus point of between heaven and earth where they meet, Hmm. right? The most holy place is the place because that's where the dwelling of God is. But man has no access to that. It only has access once a year and by way of blood. Mm -hmm. What does that communicate to you? That God is distant and cut off, that you're not allowed to be there, that there's a distance between heaven and earth. That's right. That in some meaningful way, that there is a dis- There's a difference. Difference, right? Oh. And yet, there is an intimacy that is possible, hmm. but it's a very limited intimacy, hmm. and it's only once a year, and that limited intimacy has a specific requirement, hmm. which is blood. So then... The author of Hebrews, the pastor of Hebrews, teaches us in verse 8. This is what you highlighting, Tyler. Mm-hmm. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing. 
Hmm. Huh? Yeah. Because because that wouldn't have made a lot of sense if you were to watch the the rituals. It's not as though they destroyed the holy place in order to get into the most holy place. <laughs> right. Like every burn single every single year, they just burn it down, tear right. it down, and then go in and then rebuild it back up for the rest of the year. And then look at verse nine, which is symbolic for the present age. Hmm. So the first that's still standing, like not only the first apartment, but even in some way the first sanctuary, mm -hmm. as long as it functions the way it functions with this one high priest who only has this very limited access, the Holy Spirit is teaching us that in some very real way, access into the true holy places is very limited and is not yet opened because this first one is still standing, which is symbolic of the present age. Hmm. So what do we need? We need this... Um, this this veil opened. We need unfettered access. How are we gonna get it? Remember, you still got Melchizedek orbiting around because mm -hmm. he cannot. He doesn't correspond to this first sanctuary. So you see how the author is setting up a problem mm -hmm. that needs to get solved. So in conclusion, verse nine. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. Mm -hmm. So again, you have a limitation. So the human has a limitation into the most holy place that ought to indicate something. Hmm. And now the author, the pastor of Hebrews is telling us, and this can't perfect the conscience of the worshiper. Hmm. Like, wait, 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 what's going on then? Hmm. Verse 10, but they deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for what? The, the body. body. Ah, very important detail. Imposed until the time of redemption. There's a lot of connections between this and Colossians 2, huh? A ton. Because Colossians 2, one, you mentioned the veil. Colossians 2 is where it talks about a veil being torn, yeah? And no? Well, uh, well, okay, we have the verse where it talks about uh, his body being the flesh torn, yeah. right? Uh, in Colossians 2, the circumcision of the flesh there that took is. place yep. in his body. Yep. And then at the end of Colossians 2, which I always thought was kind of unrelated until right this moment, hmm. is this thing about, so don't let anyone judge you according to food and drink. Mm -hmm. And it just comes up right Ooh. here in verse 10. And what's that connection? I don't know. Tell oh, me. Okay. Oh, I don't I'm know. Just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just seeing that like there's a connection between those things. And all of a sudden, if, if Colossians 2 is also bringing up food and drink, seemingly randomly, it's not random. Mm -mm. There's, a, there's a direct connection to the body of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. that in him we receive the circumcision of the flesh, mm -hmm. and then it goes on to talk about certain things that maybe would cut off the people, mm -hmm. like in their mind, mm -hmm. according to defiling of the body. Mm -hmm. I see, yep. That's provocative. Is it? Yeah. Uh. I mean, I don't think we're going to go that direction. But that is worth <laughs> Okay, cool. <laughs> but we are going to go into the body, but the point is here that the setup is that there is a sanctuary service that is inaugurated, but in it being inaugurated and it has daily operations where the Levitical priests come in and out, there is a portion of this place that does not have unfettered access. Why does it not have unfettered access? Because it's not open for business in an unfettered way, the way the first uh, is open. And then the Paul, you know, Hebrews 9, he's like, and that's about this present age because the first has to do with washings and cleansings of body and rituals, but it can't actually perfect the conscience because something else has to happen. The sanctuary is indicating it to us, but it's not localized here. Hmm. Okay. Oh, so this, maybe this is a clarification that's helpful for me. When he's talking about that this is for the present age, he's not referring to what exists in the holy place. He's actually referring to the thing that's limited. He's saying that limited thing is for today. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the present age from the vantage point of the author. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah, yeah. And in the in the and and not only the age like is in temporal, right? But understand age as in the situation as it is with the 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 world as it is with its uh, 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 imprisonment to sin. Yeah. So it's right? less about like from this date forward. If this was written in. 4580 or whatever, whenever he was written, he's not really talking about a date per se, but just since 
this major thing has happened and we can infer that he's talking about Jesus. So he's talking about the world as it is. This is the present age because it's the age of the flesh. It's the age of the dominion of sin of powers and principalities, but there's an eternal age, mm. but those ages can coincide at the same time, mm. right? But it's a different age. It's a different era. It's a different way of being. It's mm. a different reality. It's a different existence, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So he's saying that the present age is one of corruption. It's one of susceptibility to sin. It's one where the sanctuary system is teaching us something about an age that is to come but as long as this sanctuary system is still working and teaching mm. then the actual age that it's pointing to hasn't come because this one is still standing doing its work mm. does that make sense mm -hmm. as long as you're still going to kindergarten and learning in kindergarten you haven't transitioned to first grade but first grade could be running while you're still in kindergarten so those ages can exist simultaneously but as long as you're continuing being taught in kindergarten the age of first grade for you has not come mm. right this is analogy right that works that yeah. makes a lot of sense to me but as soon as you are transitioned from this to that the old fades away because why go back to kindergarten once you're in first grade right so that which comes later has a surpassing glory to that which has been although that which was before instructed you unto that which would come so you needed kindergarten to get in first grade but once you're in first grade you don't go back to kindergarten mm -hmm. but as long as kindergarten Garden is still standing and you're still entering kindergarten you haven't actually entered into first grade now melchizedek melchizedek is the first grade teacher she might be orbiting around the kindergarten room but does not actually come into kindergarten room because although she's a teacher i don't know why i went female on there i'm so sorry <laughs> although he's a teacher right although he's a teacher he does not correspond to kindergarten but kindergarten teaches you about first grade that he will correspond to mm -hmm. that's what's going on